Well, Paul, you might remember last week I was whining and moaning because my desk was disorganized. Yeah, you were, you were losing your mind, I think. Right. And as sufferable as all that complaining was, I'm not sorry. Um, this week I am much better off. We have finished my new desk. We have... Um, Ooh. There's a so is this a desk here. purchased specifically for the new office, or is this just one that you yes. you finally assembled? Yeah. It is a used desk we found at the used stuff store. We call it the thrift store. I I forget what it gets called in other places, but you know the it's not a pawn shop, but people unload their crap here for free, and then it gets resold for super low prices to other people. That's what it Habitat is. Habitat for Humanity. Um, no, we don't call it that. That would be for houses, but, um, <laughs> this place, uh, I, f I forget what the real name is. Heather always just calls it the thrift store, but, uh, we got this giant executive desk for $15. Nice. Yeah. It was all, it was all scuffed up. The, the top was really really scuffed like you would have to resurface it so we did we painted it and i and she put a layer of epoxy on the top and it gives it this really glassy sheen on top it's you know you can Ooh. set your drink on it it doesn't like screw up the desktop it's just this wonderful like i'm I, a few years before a few years ago i never heard of pouring epoxy to, to seal a desktop. No, that didn't mean it didn't exist. I just never heard of it. And we did that. And now it's this wonderful glossy surface. You can see a picture at the top of the show notes. I will have it in the show notes on the site when this goes live. So you can see what I'm talking about. But it just sort of like this wonderful yeah, glassy nice. reflection. Yeah. And that and it's just got enough room for all the cable we forgot to drill the cable drop and this thing is so heavy and isaac and i were just struggling to get it into the house and we were both like well i was gasping and and trying to wait for the heart attacks to subside before we moved it into place and isaac was you know very mildly winded because he's 18 and people like that are indestructible but then i put my monitor on it and went to wire it up and i realized crap we were gonna drill a cable drop in the middle of the surface and i forgot that step so all the cords are run down the back but what can you do it's not going back downstairs i'll tell you that can you just like bring the drill upstairs we we might do that we, we might i'm not in any hurry to mess with it i'm happy and i'm able to work now without going crazy i'm good and it looks kind of sci-fi now. Yes, it does. I mean, this is what I've always wanted. Something to reflect all the lights on my desk so that it looks all shiny and cool. It just... I I think I mentioned this on a previous diecast. Like, my wife and my son, not, I, my, my middle child, Peter, can't work with a clean desk. And I can't work with a messy one. Like, I just sit there the whole time trying to type, just thinking about all the crap on my desk that needs to be cleaned up. And so now that, <laughs> that sort of constant... And, you know, sometimes you can become trapped. Like, there, okay, there's nowhere to put this right now. Like, we're still unpacking. There's this pile of crap and the printer and all its cables, and you can't move it. It's got to go right there. <laughs> there's just You can't clean off your desktop. It's it's not big enough to hold all the stuff that goes on it. And so it's, it was just this constant... I mean, I realize this sounds incredibly OCD, but yeah, that's what I went through for a couple weeks. Nice. Well, I'm glad that you've you've resolved that heartache. Okay, let, let's make it clear. That was the most petty, infantile, bullshit tiny mind problem anybody could have and it's probably a sign of profound neurosis that it was bothering me but that's where i was at for two weeks but i think you have more substantial problems here in the show notes so tell me about your problems this week yeah so uh this is my first week 
back at work at the new job slash old job. And um, since I was working there last about eight years ago, uh, two of the people that were working there have moved on. Uh, one of them was the programmer. And so uh, he, he had, you know, been doing his job and code running and stuff. Um, but then he left some, some weeks ago or maybe some months ago. And um, so they got someone else to come in just kind of temporarily to like do some coding because they need some coding done. And uh, so then when I came on, they had the guy come back, the, the temporary guy. So he explained to me like how this works. And uh, so he's like, all right, so you go over here and you boot up this old Windows 7 machine. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, this is going to be good. And he's like, and, you know, the, the power cable here is uh, we need to get a new one. But it's, you know, you got you to kind of move it just so so that it, like because it's broken inside, apparently. And so you just move it just so so that the power stays on. And I was like, oh, oh, good. <laughs> And uh, Those power cables are practically free on Amazon. They everything comes with a power cable. How could that still be a problem? I don't but go know, ahead. Seamus. I don't know. I don't understand. So I, then I'm going, uh, all right, good. So this is an Arduino uh, thing. They're they're doing some Arduino programming. It's like, okay, I know how to program an Arduino. Uh, so this is gonna be familiar, but no, they've got like this whole IDE. That's so that you can program the Arduino in, in C++. And they've got all these libraries and stuff. And so he's like, okay, so you you start this this IDE program. I'm like, oh, okay. And he's like, and it always takes like five minutes to start up. I was like, oh, good. Oh, good. Oh. So the wow. IDE finally boots up. And there's the Arduino code. And I was like, well, well hang on. It like... Where did where is this code where does this code live like he's like I don't know it just whenever he was working on the Arduino code he used this computer and he used this IDE and and like here it is and when I opened it up the the code was there and so I just didn't mess with it <laughs> so I was like oh great and so now I'm gonna have to figure out like where this because you gotta back up the code somehow so there's like right this, you need source this control. Windows seven box with it. oh yeah and so. So then he's like, and there's, you know, there's this .svn folder in this. I don't know what's in there. I haven't gone in there. I was like, oh, that's, mm, that's the source control. He's like, oh, yeah, I've managed to go through my whole career as a programmer and never had to use source control. I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Hmm. <laughs> that's sort of alarming. I suppose, you know what, <laughs> maybe that, I can't think of a situation where that makes sense. I mean, even if you're doing embedded systems where the code is tiny, you still want versions of it. What? I guess someone else always did it for him or something. I, I don't know. Anyway, so the whole thing is quite alarming. And, and when we got into the actual code, it was like, okay, this is straightforward. You know, state machines and functions that call other functions. And you've got some flags and some interface strings that you send through the com port and like it's all it's all basic stuff um but it's just like built on this teetering tower of like weird unused unexamined technology that if it breaks at any time no one would know how to put it back together you'd have to like figure it out from the ground from the ground up i mean that makes sense for a company that doesn't have enough programming work for a full one full-time programmer but Oh, that is, that is tough. Yeah, so apparently that's part of my job now is like, be the Arduino guy. And so I'm going to have to like, figure out where they keep their Tortoise SVN server and figure out how to sync it up and I was just going to say, S commit structure S is. SVN files, I was like, oh man, that's Tortoise, which I always really preferred. Tortoise is not as robust, robust as Git. I take it. Um, and in fact, I've found, you know, when I read the directions on how to use Git, it's always like, what are all these steps for? All I want to do is check in a piece of code, but I need several steps. I don't understand why or what they do. And of course, that's really bad. You need to understand your tools. And Tortoise was always like right at my level. 
Like that's the level of complexity where you've got one or two people working on a project of, you know, less than a million lines of code. It just it made sense to have a real simple tool for for interfacing with it. So I love Tortoise. Yeah, I, I used Tortoise years and years ago, more than, oh man, 15 years ago when I was in college, um, doing just for my own stuff, like on my own box, I made a repository like in another folder and just used it for version control and stuff. But it became too, it was too much of a hassle. Like I I stopped using it because just like, well, why am I backing up all these versions of this thing? Like, I just want the latest version. I'm just going to save over the thing in the, with the latest version. So, I don't know. I guess I'm not a very good programmer either. I'll fit right in. <laughs> with this with this setup, yeah, it sounds like it. So, so that was one of the Snowflake servers is I, it's, just, it's not that bad. I'm sure people in the comments are going to like kill, tell us all their horror stories. Um, but the other one was this other Windows 7 box. Where okay, so so that was one of the guys. One of the guys is the programmer. The other guy that left was the electrical engineer. So he did all like the circuit boards and you know designed all the you know resistors and capacitors and stuff. And uh, so he also he retired, and um, apparently he left a like copy installed copies of the software that you need to use to design the circuit boards, and we need to make a circuit board update, and so. Um, I was like, okay, well, how do we do that? Like, and uh, and so they're just like, well, okay, we'll go in this folder and install this program. And so I do, and it's like, well, this program isn't like this program is that it's part of a whole suite of like uh, simulation circuit design software. So you can like design the whole thing and simulate it all virtually and see how it's going to work with all the inputs and outputs and stuff. Um, and then once you've got your design, then you can make a board design that implements the circuit design and so the, the software that they had was the the design software not the board software and what we need to do is change the board because the, the only thing we need to change is the the printouts on some of the connectors are reversed and so like and it's been this way for like 10 years I and mean, every time they get the boards back they have to desolder all the connectors and like turn them around and solder them all back in because they're in backward <laughs> So it's one of those dumb things where it's like, oh, well, okay, this can't be that hard, right? You just got to like flip it around. And uh, so anyway, the software that, that they had a copy of like doesn't do that. It doesn't do boards. It just does circuits. So I was like, okay, well, how did he make these boards in the first place? Like, what, what did he do? And like, well, there's this computer over here and like, come walk this way. And so we walk, you know, over the thing and there's a little cubicle and there's these two computers. And so they like unhook the internet from one of the computers and plug it into the other computer and like <laughs> unhook the mouse and keyboard from one of the computers and plug it into the other computer because like they never use this thing right right and you know and like turn on the monitor and like boot it up and it's a windows 7 box oh no and uh and like here's the here's the software and like you start it up and like and then you have to like go through all this and I was like well how do I use this software and they're like no one knows don't don't even bother asking <laughs> the guy who the only person who knew how to use this software is retired and and he doesn't want to talk to anybody he wants to ride jet skis it's like okay here we go so you know start googling stuff and like here's the I've got a folder with some files in it and I've got this software that no one knows how to use and so anyway I, I managed to make a little bit of progress, but um, that's another thing. It's like, well, I, I guess this is my job now too, is excavation in archaeology. I always wanted to be an archaeologist and, and didn't really understand right. why that would be a bad idea. Right. You're, you're looking for the Rosetta Stone that will allow you to understand the original manuals that were yeah. for this so <laughs> okay. software that were actually yeah, in Aramaic. The, you click the online manuals button and it's like error. And it's not like a, it's not like it brings up a browser. It's like it brings up its own like little window that's supposed to be its own built-in browser or whatever. And that's got an error in it. And it's like, is this an error because the software doesn't work or because 
it needs to be updated or because the online manuals don't exist anymore or because it's looking on this machine somewhere that the manuals aren't there where they didn't install them who knows who knows what why that's truly crazy so i think we might need to like talk to the people who actually make the circuit boards for us and tell them like just tell them what we need to do <laughs> maybe they can fix it on their end oh the whole having two mission critical computers sharing a mouse and keyboard just like i mean th that happens but it always just makes it feels so strange is it really that extravagant to like dump 50 bucks on this computer that is absolutely critical to our survival as a company is that unreasonable could we get yeah. a router here so that they could share this internet connection <laughs> It's like 80 yeah. bucks, come on. Well, I mean, the, the, I think the point is that it's not critical. Like, no one's used this computer since this guy's retired, apparently. <laughs> it's like, why Why would you need... You, no one knows how to use the software anyway, so, like, we just don't change the boards. We just don't touch them. Just leave them alone. Someday they'll need to be updated, though, right? Yeah, well, it's today. Anyway... Do you have any hardware news since we're talking about servers and stuff? I do. This one's a heartbreaker. So, like, I've noticed most people are very nostalgic for their first console. Like, talk to people that played, you know, Ocarina of Time on the N64. And they're just like, oh, I spent a whole summer. Or, oh, I remember this wonderful time with my big sister. She helped me through, you know, and, and taught me the controls and, and told me how to find, taught me how to do the dungeons or whatever. Or I remember the, the older kids in the neighborhood would come over and I was just so in awe of how they were good they were at Super Mario Brothers. And you'll see strata of this through history. Um, you know, the, the kids that were... N64, the kids that were original NES, who are almost my age, the, the, you know, the people that were into the Dreamcast or the Genesis or whatever, all of those, all of those generations. Yeah, yeah. Like, my, my family never had a, or didn't have a console until much later, but my grandparents had an original Nintendo system. Uh, and they just had Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt. But when we come over to visit, sometimes Grandpa would take us to the Blockbuster and we would get to rent a game for it. Blockbuster? I'm not familiar with this business. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, you need a time machine now to go back and right. remember. Right. So everybody's nostalgic for their first couple of consoles. But not me. My first console was the Atari 2600 in the early 80s. I'm not sure when we got ours. It was probably 81 or so. Um, for one thing, my life sucked at that period of time. It was really, really bad. But for another thing, it just wasn't that good of a games machine. Like, like I've said, I got when the, the gaming crash hit, I didn't know that a gaming crash was going on. In 83, I didn't know there was this major shakeup in the world of business. I just remember, you know, a big bin of games that were discounted, you know, 90% off. And I didn't want any of them. They were dirt cheap. And I was like, this all looks yeah. like garbage. So, yeah, it was the big cardboard bin on a pallet jack pallet. So yeah. they could just take that whole thing and put it right in the dumpster at the end of the day. Right, <laughs> right. It was just, oh, so crazy. And so I'm not nostal that nostalgic for the 2600. Also, the games back then did not, were not that great for engendering nostalgia. They were shallow. You know, this was the, these were the first rough efforts. I think we and, did end up having, getting a, an Atari 2600, um, what was it? garage sale edition i think it came with a big cardboard box of like every game ever published for yes <laughs> yep yep everybody wound up with one of those eventually and then yeah. 
they would they would you know play it for a month and a half, realize oh these are all garbage and I'm bored with them, and they would just live on in another garage sale. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we did that. We would we would get out. We had the the bo big box of games, and the one joystick that hadn't broken yet, and uh, <laughs> right. And we would like sit down with dad in the evening. And just like start taking games out of the box and plugging them in the thing and like, is this any good? Nope. Toss it in the garbage. Get the next one out. Plug it in. Is this any good? This one doesn't even run. Toss it in the garbage. Yeah. Yeah, so I was never attached to the original Atari. I just had no love for it. I don't want to say no love, but it was fleeting. It, it, I liked it at the time, but then after its time passed... I don't look back on it as this wonderful moment in gaming history. Mm. It's like, oh, there was a necessary intermediate step. Glad it led us to all this awesome stuff later on. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like the dentist chairs with the straps on the arms, where you're like, okay, better than your teeth rotting out of your head, but I'm glad that we've moved on from that. Right, right. Uh, so... I just found out, this has been going on for years, but apparently like three years ago or four years ago. Okay, I just heard about this yesterday. I caught up with this story. And I've been like seeing little snatches of it here and there, but like ignoring it because I don't care about Atari. And I knew already that this wasn't the Atari of old. The Atari of old died and got bought out by like Hasbro and then somebody bought out, brought out bought out Hasbro Interactive, not Hasbro the toy place, but the the games division. And so this the name of Atari has been bouncing around for just decades. It's a brand, right? It's not a specific group of people. It's a brand that yeah, gets yeah. licensed and stuck onto things. So apparently the story now, I'm, like I said, I just caught up on this and and I've gone over the cliff notes of it, and the cliff notes of it are so horrible that I just wanted to share them. So, like, three or four years ago, they kickstarted. Like, whoever... Okay, what are you doing on Kickstarter? Person who owns the Atari... The rights to use the Atari name. You should not be on Kickstarter. That's like Disney... I mean, they're not as big as, you know, there's a certain, once you're above a certain company size, you don't go to Kickstarter. You should have the money for this. Well, and they, it, technically, they didn't go to Kickstarter. They were, um, they were on Indiegogo. Oh, right, right, right. I'm sorry. Yeah, the link is right here. Thank you for the link, by the way. The link is, a, is an Indiegogo link. So it's not even as good as a Kickstarter. It's like we're too, we suck too bad to do a proper Kickstarter. So we're <laughs> going to do an Indiegogo. Uh -huh. And they raised $3 million. Now, that's, that sort of sh shows two things. One, $3 million is not a lot of money as far as showing interest in the ancient... Pa they're kickstarting a new Atari console, which they call the Atari VCS, which is confusing because the very first, before the Atari 2600 was called the 2600, it was called the VCS. Is this like the Tomb Raider reboot or Doom reboot or something? Right, huh? right. Or maybe it wasn't VCS, but it's definitely a three-letter acronym that begins with V. And it wasn't VCR. It just makes me think of VCR. Yeah, exactly. It's like, that's not right. good branding. No, it's not at all. And but the three million is not a lot for re for whatever revisiting this ancient brand. And it's really, yeah. really, really not enough if you want to actually build a console today. If you're trying to build a console today, you need big bucks. That is not a small project. No. I don't understand the scope of this. Is this like, are they trying to build a cutting edge console to compete in the market? Or are they trying to build like a box with a Raspberry Pi in it that will let you play old Atari games? That's an excellent question. It's a question they should have asked before they ran the Indiegogo. They didn't know what they were oh, no. making. Oh, like no. they. 
they still don't seem to know what they're making. Like, they announced all these weird features. They're like, it'll have all these classic games on it. So you're thinking, oh, it's just going to be one of these boxes of, a, a you know, here's a hundred Atari games for 50 bucks or whatever kind of deals. Yeah, and, yeah, that like, you could find on the internet for free for, like, right? back in 1997. Right. But, you know, here, you know, fresh box, you know it works, it'll connect to a modern monitor, that would, that would all make sense as a product. But no, they seem to be making, like, a real grown-up, big boy pants console. So, they, they had a, a physical demonstration, like, they showed the console itself, which was kind of shaped like the 2600, except it didn't have all those stupid buttons on it, because it's like, you're not going to need to switch between VHF and UHF on the new machine. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a thing anymore. Um, so it is very reminiscent of the old one in terms of styling, but everybody's like, great, what's in it? What's, what can you do with this machine besides play Atari games? And they still didn't have any hardware specs. So were they and like then, using the old molds or something? Like, did they get a hold no, of the old no. injection molds? No, no, this is definitely a new case. It's, it's reminiscent, but it's much smaller and it's got rounded corners instead of those really sharp boxy corners of the original oh, it just man. sort of has yeah. this it sort of has this camel hump in the back where in the old one it would have had all those right. giant apollo 13 toggle switches yeah 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 with the u-bolts next to them so you don't accidentally bump them in your flight suit <laughs> right <laughs> ancient oh the switches on the machine the ones we had back in the day were awful they were just straight cylinders that it doesn't fl I, I called it i called it an apollo 13 toggle switch but it actually was not that quality it's a straight cylinder that slides back and forth and it does yes. not have a yes yeah. i remember those you, you want to you want to grab them on the end and toggle them like a like a light switch kind of so like swing, you're thinking it swing rotates. them like a big lever. Yeah, like a yeah. yeah that, that it was But that doesn't work. You got to grab them at the base or else you just break them off. Right. And then when you do get it moving, it doesn't have it. It just sort of has this sloppy, slidey action. It doesn't like <laughs> yeah, it doesn't you don't click in mean, place. Right. The the only thing good about the old toggle switches was that lovely when they nail, you know, and you know, I just switched it. And those ones, you just sort of, it feels like a volume knob where it's like, well, is it up now? <laughs> right. Have I made contact? What What's happened? Oh, so awful. Such an awful garbage hardware on the original. But anyway, so that whole thing where you would plug in cartridges and the old toggle switches was this giant lump, this giant sort of... Um, angled lump with with sharp corners on it and that's been just turned yeah. into this vague sort of hip <laughs> type curve on the on so, the back of the machine so it seems like the original design was like someone designed a circuit board and that went in the base and that defined the size of the machine and then some other engineer designed a whole bank of like interface parts the part where you plug the cartridge in and the part where all the switches are and then those two guys got together in a meeting and they're like, okay, how are we going to put this box together with this box? And then someone's like, we should hire a designer for this. And then that guy got fired and they just put the boxes together. <laughs> right. They're like, how hard is it? We just need a box to contain all these wires in our circuit board. And yeah, yeah it wasn't until Nintendo came. Like, that's what happens. The very first consoles were these awful things that looked like they were built by engineers. Just like a circuit board inside of a shoebox design. Right. And then, and then, you know, Nintendo was like, we have an idea. What if we made this look like something that you would want to have visible in your living room? Something you wouldn't be ashamed of owning. Okay, so, right. so they're, they're going, they're trying to hearken back to the horrible design of the original Atari. <laughs> right. Right, is that what right. is that what we're seeing here? 
Yes. But then, I mean, there was no updates. Like, I think they, the system missed its date when it was supposed to go into production. And they were like, yeah, we're not going to hit it. We're still working on it. And then the lead system designer, the lead hardware designer, their Steve Wozniak, quit. And in a public statement, he said he hadn't been paid in six months. Now, oh, no. If you're not paying that guy, then who are you paying? You must not be paying any. He, that is the very last person I would stiff. I would, I would stiff anybody but that guy. And so then they had this statement on their site where it's like, well, this has never been, this project, we believe in it, we've got great people, and it's never been dependent on any one person. I'm like, wrong! Your hardware guy left! You're fucked! <laughs> That's <laughs> right. You can't make a console without hardware. Right. It's never been dependent on any one person. I'm like, do you have another one of those guys that you're also not paying? <laughs> He's just sticking around unless you've got now, another how, one. How long had the project been going at that point? That was over a year at that point. Because like, if you've got 10 people on staff... $3 million doesn't last much more than a year no. or two. No, they also were... Now, I don't know the timeline on this, but they've also been bringing in investors to back the... And then they started okay. selling pre-orders. They were taking pre-orders for this machine, and it was not done being designed yet. That's insane. Did they have a spec at least? No. They did not when they started taking pre-orders. Now they have a spec. Hmm. And this, okay, the, the, they seem to be sort of spiraling inward on this vague design where it's basically a Linux box, but it's a, not a custom Linux distro that they've, you know, it's not like they spent months rolling their own special build of Linux to run games. This is an off-the-shelf Linux build. And this thing costs $380, which is $80 more than right now the, the cheapest PS4. And it has one quarter the processing power of that... Uh, of that oh, no. PlayStation 4. Yeah. So you're asking $80 more for a quarter. And, and we're on the cusp of a new generation. And the new generation is, I think, going to be an entire order, order of magnitude more powerful. An order... Like, this thing is in the same price ballpark with modern consoles. It's almost $400. And it's going to have an order of magnitude less power. And it's basically just a shitty game, uh, just a shitty PC, gaming PC. We don't yeah, know the graphics. Linux box, last I checked, isn't even a gaming PC. It's just a PC. Right. Now, you can make it play games under certain situations. They have, they, they showed off one game that was like... Um, Tempest 4000. It's sort of a reimagining of the original Tempest, which incidentally was not on the 2600 because the 2600 could not run Tempest. But anyway, huh. Tempest 4000, and then uh, out of the blue, the person, a Tempest 4000 is already done and already out on other platforms. I think it's even out on Steam. And that guy came forward and said, um, they didn't ask me about it. I didn't agree to have my game on their platform. Uh, so I, I don't know what they're doing, showing it off. Uh-oh. So, and, um, and then in their demo footage, okay, there was two things wrong. Like, in their demo footage, they're trying to show how this can also be a media center. Like, you can watch Netflix. So they had somebody start a video in Netflix. And you could see in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, it had a little pop-up that says, Chrome is now in, in full-screen mode. Press whatever button to exit full-screen. <laughs> so they just started up Chrome. Like, that was their media solution, is start Chrome and run it in a web browser. And then... <laughs> an, 
another game they were they were supposedly streaming this game, but you could see a watermark in the lower right corner that says activate windows. Oh no! No, stop! <laughs> Yes. So not only were they, I mean, that means it's fake because this is a Linux machine and they're obviously running it on Windows, but then it's not even a registered version of Windows. Like they couldn't even be bothered to pay for a copy of Windows to make this fake demo. But then on top of that, they were so illiterate in terms of gaming and technology and marketing but that they didn't know it was a bad thing to have that watermark on the screen. Or they just didn't notice the watermark because they have no clue what they're doing. It is... It's just this perfect storm of incompetence. You can tell the people in charge don't understand hardware. They're just people that had the idea, we could use this name to sell hardware. And they don't know what they're doing. And the, the ship date has slipped and slipped and slipped, and here we are in 2020. It was two years ago. And we're not even sure that they finalized the design, which they need to do that before they can arrange for production, before they can build the dang things, before they could ship them to stores, before you could actually buy one. But they're still taking pre-orders. You can go into like Best Buy or whatever and slap down $380 for this thing that hasn't even left the dry erase board yet. What? How do they get how do they get big box stores to sign up for that? I'll bet it's the Atari name. I'll bet it's the Atari name. Wow. They they see Atari and figure, oh, this is a legit company. Like if you just approach them as like um you know, Bob's console company, they'll be like, get out of here. We, you know, we need to see the hardware before we're going to, like, sell it in our stores. But they saw something with the Atari brand. And so this is, this feels like the classic team that's all marketing and no software designers. No, I mean, what have they been building all this time? If we've come all this time and it's still just smoke and mirrors for the demo then what have they done over all this time? Are they just absorbing money to put in their Swiss bank account before they all piss off? Oops. Oh, it's harder than we thought. Bye. Wouldn't put it past them at this point. I mean, right. it seems like they're if they can't even pay their lead system designer, it seems like they're not designing a console. They're just designing a lie. A ruse. Right. Right. <laughs> they're trying to bamboozle us. Yeah, so, but their lead Roos designer is well paid. <laughs> that guy. Well, he thinks he's being well paid. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a shame. I don't have a lot of um, loyalty to the Atari name, but it's just a shame to see it defaced like this. That's just obnoxious. Um, and I feel sorry for all the, the people who have put money into this when it's obviously a giant sham. There was another video I just saw earlier today, and I'm not sure I have the facts right on this. So don't quote me on this, but it was something to the effect of they've got another project they're working on, which is this custom, I don't know, cryptocurrency, which can be used in games for gambling. Like... They, they in the kind UK, of wanted... maybe. <laughs> right. I'm not sure how it works, but I was like, wait, wait. They're trying to make this, like, real... I think it's the same company, but different project is, like, a cryptocurrency that can be used as a currency that isn't tied to any particular country that might have gambling restrictions, and then this money can be used for... And not, like, loot boxes, but, like... Gamble for money, play roulette or whatever online or black or whatever people do. And so this is just obviously this incredibly shady company. And I don't think anybody, anybody that understands gaming it believes in this project. But it still is really irritating that these charlatans have shown up. And that this is what they've decided to do with the Atari name.
Because you could have made a fun con, you could have made a product, you know, with the right team. You could make something that people would buy, even if it was just like yeah. every game out on Atari in a box. I mean, this has been done before, but something that looks like the original, you know, that they're. There would be a market for that, but no, they, they've they just or, been running this scam for years. Or you could go for broke and be like, we're, we're going in on the shittiest hardware, on the absolute lowest bottom dollar uh, circuit design. We're going to make the cheapest feeling, looking, and smelling product anywhere, and, and who wants some of that for your nostalgia? <laughs> right. We promise we're going to come out with a new game every week and it will be absolutely unplayable, just like in 1983. Just you will like, be. Like back in the day. Back in the day when you plug in a cartridge, you play it for 12 seconds, and then you realize it's awful and you go back to Space Invaders that you've been playing since 79. You just like. <laughs> You give people like a, a an STL model so they can print their own cartridges, and then you just like generate labels and they can print their own labels and like put them on the cartridges. All right, well that's enough about terrible video games. Tell me, tell me you've played a good video game, Paul. Oh yeah, well uh, last week I was playing East Shade. Uh, I played it for um, maybe about a half hour, an hour or so, and uh, after the show. I went to bed and then I got up in the morning and I played East Shade all day and I beat it and it was pretty good. You got past the final boss. Yeah, did I you, had to jump on his head three to... times. <laughs> you did. You take. Did you do all the side quests to unlock the legendary weapons, which would I guess be the legendary paintbrush? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It was well. So that's that's kind of actually this is an interesting point. So you can't get any better at actually painting. Like there's no progression system for the for the painting itself. Like you just start off as a prodigal painter, a prodigy, prodigal, I don't know. You're good at painting and and then like throughout the game you're you're just like you're good at painting and like at the end still good at painting. So not much of an arc there, I guess. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. It was it was like this. Yeah, it, it was more about the the relationships that you built with people than it was about the painting itself. Like the painting was was a way of expressing your care for people or or your interest in the world, um, as opposed to an, an expression of your own personal power. Interesting. So what's the painting gameplay like? Like, what do you do to paint a picture in this game? Uh, you have to gather, you have to get canvases so that, so there's two resources that go into making a painting, canvases and inspiration. Canvases you get by either gathering wood and canvas and then crafting them into a canvas, uh, wood and cloth, I guess. Uh, or you can purchase them at the art store in the town once you gain access to the town. Uh, which you do not do by painting, although it can be part of it. And then inspiration, so that's the, the canvas part. You use one canvas for every painting. Uh, and then you can paint over a painting that you've already done using an existing painting. And so you, you, you only need more canvases when you give people paintings. Uh, if you just want to keep making paintings, you can just keep painting over the same one over and over again. Can you show the painting? You can go like, here, a painting I made for you, and they reach out for it, and you pull it back. No, no, I'm going to reuse the canvas, but I made, did make this for you. Okay, bye. Yes, you can. There's a dialogue option of like, give painting or no thank you. And it's like, you could keep it if you want. You don't have to give it to them. But they'll ask you to make a painting for them, and you're like, oh, I painted it, and here it is. And they're like, oh, wow, it's amazing. I'm going to put it on my wall. And then there's the dialogue option of like, do you actually give it to them? <laughs> Amazing. Here's I, I a never picture tried of your late mother. I've no. decided to keep it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh no. So anyway, so so that's the canvas part, and then there's the inspiration part. And inspiration, you use one inspiration every time you make a painting, whether you give it away or not. It's just 
you just use it up and it's gone forever and uh an inspiration you get by uh there's some mostly by exploring so like you go to a new place and you get some inspiration or you uh talk to a person about something and you get a little inspiration usually it's it's exploring though and it's supposedly it's like seeing new things or trying new things or things like that so kind of like exposing yourself to to new influences and, and experiences and exposing um, yourself to the town i understand this is why they want you to leave <laughs> right you're an artist can't be constrained by convention Wait, so is it possible to softlock yourself if you just go out and paint, like, you find a dumb rock and you just paint that rock every time you get a, a piece of in, inspiration, then can you still beat the game or get through all the content? It might be possible to softlock. I, I haven't tried, <laughs> but, but it might be possible. Uh, I know that there are... Uh, renewable sources of inspiration later in the game like you can go down in the basement and take some sweet drugs Peyote. and get inspiration that way <laughs> yeah yeah you go on a trip and do a little jumping puzzle or go and like water the tree or chop it down or whatever in your dreams and then you get some inspiration um and then i think you can also craft tea using so again drugs i guess <laughs> using plants that you find and things uh, I, I I didn't actually try the tea crafting part of the game, but it's my understanding that you can also gain inspiration that way. That's endless, basically. Um, but I didn't have any trouble getting enough inspiration to do all the stuff I want. You cap out at 15 inspiration, and I ended up capping out a couple times. Um, I did end up running down to like two or three once, um, but that's because I was doing a bunch of quests and I wasn't exploring at all. And as soon as you start exploring again, your inspiration goes way back up. So, uh, it wasn't a challenge to keep it all under control, but it was uh, it was a mechanic, and it, it made you cognizant of like, don't just go and paint a rock twenty times, right? Like, it's gonna be a bad idea. <laughs> same rock, same angle, twenty paintings, right? And I like the way they did it. The, it's like. Um, it's kind of like the witness, I guess, where like when you do a painting, it's just like, here's the, you know, crop on your screen, what you want to paint. And then you get, say, go. And then it basically takes a screenshot and then runs it through some filters and makes like a, a painting. Um, and it looks really good. Like I was playing it with my kids and my kids commented, like, the painting looks better than the game does. And I was like, yeah, it really does. It, for whatever reason, like it's just really. It feels like you've captured something magical about the world, even though it's like, obviously, they just ran it through, like, an oil painting filter from the GIMP or whatever. Right. That's cool. I meant to play it this week, but then, you know, we're still renovating this house, so I did not get to it. Yeah. So, so anyway, so that's the painting thing, is like, and that's the same throughout the whole game. You don't get better paintings or worse paintings or anything. Um, but it does, there are a number of quests that are related to painting where someone will say, I want you to paint me a picture of a small stone bridge. And then you're like, oh, I remember where the stone bridge is. I went over it, you know, when I was on my way. And so you go back there and you make a painting and you bring it back to them. And they're like, yay, I love it. And you're like, yay, I guessed what the computer wanted me to do correctly. <laughs> Wait, that's a wood bridge. Oh, you wanted a stone bridge. I thought you wanted a bridge where I'd been stoned. Sorry. <laughs> I need to get inspiration somehow, man. <laughs> no problem. I'll just go and get a little more inspiration. <laughs> well, and then there's the uh, there's the religious people who like don't like you getting inspiration in that way. That's not appropriate. Anyway, so... Um, so there's the painting part, and then a number of times I got into a situation where, like, I painted something, and it'll it'll actually bring up a notification when you complete a quest requirement for the painting. Uh, so you know right away, you don't have to, like, go all the way over there and find out, oh, you didn't get the right angle. But I did get a couple times where I thought I was painting the right thing, um, and I wasn't. But you don't find out until after you've made the painting and spent the inspiration and 
used up the canvas. I mean, like, you use the canvas again, but the inspiration doesn't come back. So it kind of felt weird to be like, if I'm really an artist and I really do know like what it is that the person wants because I get a quest notification when I've done it, then can't I just like right. check before I make the painting if this is going to be what they wanted? Right. So that was a little weird. There are a number of kind of odd things about the game like that, but um, it's a beautiful game. I mean, like the overview is it's beautiful. There's no combat. Uh, there's no violence of any kind. And um, after playing it for probably 12 hours and beat the game, I just felt like I needed to like play some sort of war game or something just to kind of like recenter myself. Go play Warface. Yeah, exactly. Shoot man. It, Isaac and I have uh, a joke about Warface. It's a real game. But every time I look at it, I think, oh, Warframe. I haven't played that. In a oh, wait, that's Warface. That's silly. That's a silly name for a game. So we use Warface as the universal symbol for completely needless uh, shooter. <laughs> All right. I really need to play that. East shade thing. Um, but let's do let's do a mailbag. Dear diecast casters, what are your thoughts on the programming language Rust, if any? All right, let's before I read the rest of this, let's just do a quick check. Do you know Rust? I know of it. Yeah, same. I I've never used it. I read about it once in a while, and it sounds good. But apparently, you know, every once in a while I check, hey, how is Rust for games? And everybody's like, well, it, it's kind of, you can kind of maybe sort of do it if you know what you're doing and, and the tools are still, the tools are still being developed. And I'm like, I'm not going there. Like, if I can't make polygons with it, it's just not an interesting language to me. I mean, it, it might be an interesting language to me in a theoretical sense, but it's not going to be something I want to spend time learning. And so, yeah, I don't mess with Rust. Yeah. I I if, just don't ever have to do anything as intense as Rust would require. All, all the stuff I need to do, I can do with Python. So it's just, that's that's all I use, basically. Right. Right. And these days, I'm really sort of enjoying C Sharp and all its indulgences. You know, all of its... Yeah all of those tools that are made for you and maybe this isn't as fast as it should be but you know what this is just so easy and and so if i got any time to put into a programming language it, it ends up going into c sharp rather than exploring other languages but which may not be the best but it's the most that's the most fun thing like i really enjoy programming in c sharp it's just really really like all my favorite parts of programming without any of the parts I hate. There you go, folks. It's the programming hedonism cast. Right. I mean, it does... Okay, don't get me wrong. I get irritated at C-sharp when, when I start to get a little bit nervous and I'm like, this might be a little... I might be cutting too many corners here. How much... How much memory slash CPU time am I wasting? And I realize, oh... I have absolutely no way of measuring that. <laughs> it's because it's just I'm so far from the hardware and there's so many layers between me and what I'm doing. And that is something that Rust could probably that that's a, a time when you wish you were using something like Rust. Yeah. But, and yeah. and I get into situations where I'm like passing strings as pointers and then casting them to integers. And, like, I don't know that I'm doing this, but it's happening. And Python's like, right. yeah, cool, sure. Just, you yeah, know, whatever. We're, it's, it's fine. We're doing great over here. And I'm like, why is my program not running like I like I think it should? And Python's like, no, it's fine. It's running, it's running fine. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Oh, that's like PHP. PHP is like that, where you can just cast anything to anything else, and it just doesn't care. It is just the most hopelessly... 
you know, people say this language is very is a very promiscuous language when it comes to types. And I'm like, this language is a goddamn slut. <laughs> it's not just promiscuous. This language is absolutely out of control. This is the spring break of languages. Yes! <laughs> the spring break, that is perfect way to describe it. The spring break of languages doesn't know what's going on, doesn't have any idea, and definitely does not care. It just wants to keep having a good time. Complete irresponsibility in programming language form. That is so accurate. That is so accurate. But hey, I mean, I never really, you know, entrust myself to that language except for the entire website that my current career is built on top of other than that i have <laughs> nothing to do with it right other than the completely custom theme that i built for my entire site which is entirely built in php other than that i don't touch it so i'm sorry i can't say anything um concrete on rust I see why we have I see we have a couple of extra questions. Are these from the comments? Yeah, I I just tossed those in there in case we had uh it run short on time and wanted to or run long on time, in case we had some extra time and wanted to talk about them. All right, go ahead with this next one. All right. This question is from Duoe and I've got a link to the comment and his question is how much do we have to pay Seamus to do a whole podcast in a fake Cockney English accent? Okay, so I imagine this is from last week when I made fun of Microsoft and I compared them to Veruca Salt. And I was like, I want to pony daddy. And I didn't know, I wouldn't have called that Cockney, but the the accent itself is so bad you could call it anything outside you know anything but normal american accent so that's probably what they were talking about yeah i think um, so you'd have to pay me enough to cover the complete exodus of supporters on my patreon when they heard <laughs> When they heard me talking like that, like there, that, that sentence I just uttered, that was probably three people right then went to Patreon and immediately canceled their support. Like, oh, I can't, I can't support this sort of behavior. That's, that's irresponsible. The world and doesn't need like any more the of that. $2, the one and $2 supporters, those are like $15 supporters right there. So right. you gotta, you gotta compensate those guys. Right, so it would be significant. It would be quite a bit of money <laughs> to make a horrible podcast that nobody wants to listen. And you got to think, not only would it be unendurable for listeners, but Paul would have to sit through the whole thing. Oh, now, see, here's something Seamus doesn't know, is that uh, I am an art an artist and an actor and I've I've done accents quite extensively before so I I could we could do a whole we could do a whole episode with just like the accents podcast I have a running joke with my kids where I pretend to know French I I know nothing about French except you know un du toi um but I I sometimes explained it to them. Oh, that's not how that word's pronounced. Yeah, that word, yeah, you don't, it's not pronounced ravine. It's French. It's, actu it's actually pronounced lavignet. And I would come up with all these absolutely outrageous <laughs> pronunciations for things and insist that no, ravine isn't ravine. Ravine is lavignet. So that's a really stupid, and the only reason they came into my mind is because I was just doing that to Isaac. He's a super good sport about it. <laughs> like, I would say he's long-suffering with that joke. Well, I mean, ravine is a French word, so... So I'm probably right, and that makes me, that makes me right, Isaac. <laughs> and, and, I mean, it is a dad joke, so... Right. I can't remember all the different... I had a bunch of them. 
you know, and I would correct their pronunciation of words they were saying correctly just to be <laughs> right. just to be a horrible person. Uh well, I guess if you if guys if you really want us to do accents, you just write in a a question to the the mailbag and be like please whoever you want to read this read this in whatever accent and then just have like whatever you want person to say and I'm like we'll have to read it cuz it's it's in the mailbag this seems like a horrible idea and i wish you hadn't said that paul <laughs> <laughs> well what's the worst that could happen so joshua says it sounds like this is in response to me talking about i haven't played any virtual desktop tabletop simulators whatever I haven't run a game through these distance, you know, virtual tabletop environments. So Joshua says, it sounds like Seamus needs to actually try being a PC in a virtual game. Uh, I, I assume they mean player character and not personal computer. I'm just going to assume that's the case. Due to his concerns about his time. That, yeah. yeah. I'm sure there are plenty of fans here who would be happy to have him try out their games. Yeah, but even, you know, I mean... Even being a player in a three-hour game, it still takes three hours. So I don't know. I didn't even I didn't even get time to drill a hole in my desk this week. Actually, I forgot to do that. <laughs> yeah, now is not the time for planning this sort of thing with our life in such ridiculous disarray. Still painting, still scrape. Here's a here's a funny thing to round out the show. Paul, have you ever felt really strongly about interior decorating? No, I have not. My, the extent of my interior decorating feelings are like when the kids knock a hole in the drywall and I'm like, ah, I really wish you hadn't done that. I, right. I wish that I didn't have to fix that hole in the drywall. Right. That's kind of how I feel too. Like if a room is painted a dumb color, I'm like, this, this would be better if it was a different color. I don't know that I would ever paint anything. I would just be very mildly annoyed. <laughs> you got but, like striped paisley on the wall, wallpaper or whatever, mm. and you're like, hmm, that could be better. Oh well. So when we moved in here, the living room and dining room are all sort of one big L-shaped room. And they have this green sort of um, pureed peas colored wallpaper <laughs> for the lower half of the wall. And then above that is a, is, I don't know what you call it, but it's a thicker kind of wall. It's like got a pattern on it that you could feel with your fingers. And it's just sort of that textured. doily, yeah, textured, but really thick, textured squiggles, like doily t pattern stuff that matches the green of the lower half of the wall. And when I came in, I was like, uh, that looks pretty 80s style. It looks, it looks like a leftover from, you know, late 70s, early 80s. That's not great. Right. And, this looks like a sitcom set. Right. And I was like, uh, that's not super great. But then, you know, I forgot all about it. And then Heather's like, we, you know, I'm looking forward to getting my office set up. My computer. She, she, her computer is still not set up. It's actually been intermittently set up on the back side of my desk. So she comes in and sits on a tiny stool and uses her computer, you know, for 10 minutes at a time to do some task. And I'm like, look, no problem. You know, she wants her computer next to her painting desk, her drawing desk. And yeah. And I'm like, go ahead, set it up. You know, we can take this wallpaper off later in the season. You know, it's like 90 degrees out now. You don't want to be painting and messing with... Uh, the other thing is this, this wallpaper is the glue itself is stronger than either the wallpaper or the drywall. I don't know what this glue is, but it is... In, I think it's adamantium glue. Um <laughs> <laughs> like, it, anything you do to take it off will destroy the two things it's binding together before the glue itself comes apart. <laughs> so, and there's solvents you can use on it that'll fix that, but they stink and you don't want to have them stinking up your house. And I'm like, look, 
let's just wait till fall. We can open all the windows, put some fans in the windows. It'll be nice and cool out, and and we'll just take it off then. And she's like, I'm not waiting and that long to set up my computer. I'm like, of course not. Set up your computer now. And, you know, we can redecorate. And she's like, you don't understand. I can't be in this room with this wallpaper. <laughs> like, to her, <laughs> it is the most oppressive thing in the world. It is just dreary and oppressive. It To her, it's like being in the hospital or something. Maybe it reminds her of a hospital she was in once or, or something. But it is just this loathsome thing. And every time she goes in the room, which... <clears throat> Dining room, living room, pretty big room in the house. Spend yeah. a lot of time in there. Every time I go in there, and I don't want to just settle in and set up my computer and then have to move all that stuff to get rid of it. I, I, I don't want to try. I won't be able to paint in this room. And I was like, wow. I've never seen any. I've never cared about interior decorating that much. But apparently. Well, you know, you care about what's on your desk you want your desk to be clean and your walls it's to true. be like all colorful and she wants her desk to be dirty and her walls to be not that color at least it's true it's true her her distaste for that wallpaper is not unlike my distaste for how trashed my desk was last week that's a that's a really good way of looking at it and that's how she was reacting to it so that's our current project is getting this indestructible wallpaper off the wall. You're just going to go down to the Home Depot and buy a bunch of new sheetrock? <laughs> we actually found something that is not chemically offensive that will take it off. It takes a little bit of time. You spray a little spot, you wait a few minutes, you give it a scrape and it peels right off. It's just, you know, you got to huh. be patient. It's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad. But there's... A lot of surface area covered with this wallpaper. So even though the, the tool makes it much easier, this is still going to be days of work. Oh, man. You couldn't just paint over it and forget the scraping? She she seriously considered that. Um, but the, the wallpaper was very textured. And she was worried that it would look bad just rolling paint over it, especially since it's kind of soft and spongy. She was worried, like, uh, if that wallpaper expands or just bends a little bit, that the, the paint will not like that. She was like, the huh. responsible Weird. thing to do. Yeah. The responsible thing to do is to have it off. Well, there you go. Came full circle. Yeah, I don't know why everybody listens to these stories about my place and offers advice, but I appreciate it. I realize it's far off topic. But hey, if you have a question for the show that is maybe on topic, the email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. We could really use some questions. Um, so please send us some. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. So I know people keep sending you hardware. Would it be crazy if someone just like sent you the Atari VCS? Oh, please don't. I wouldn't want to own that thing.